There's a fanciful definition of dukkha, or suffering, or stress, in the commentary. I say it's fanciful because it's based on a technique that the commentary often uses to try to explain different Pali terms by taking it apart into its supposed roots. In this case, dukkha is derived from words that mean a wheel that doesn't fit on its hub properly, or a hub that doesn't fit on an axle properly. And it's not a very useful definition, because it has all kinds of implications. If you put the hub back on the axle properly, then everything's okay. That would seem to put an end to suffering. If you could just bring your life back in line with nature and be okay with your natural desires and the natural way of things, everything would be okay. That's not what the Buddha taught. When he was defining suffering, he was not concerned with etymologies. He was more concerned with how can you take the suffering apart so you can be done with it? What's the best way of analyzing suffering? So you get beyond it. And he gave a long list of the various things that are suffering, came to a synopsis, which is that the five clinging aggregates are suffering. The form clinging aggregate, feeling, perception, fabrication clinging aggregate, consciousness clinging aggregate. Now the usefulness of this synopsis is that you realize that these five things that you cling to, and that's suffering. The clinging is the problem. And so when you have any experience of suffering, you look for the clinging. You look for what it is you're clinging to. And it's interesting that the, the Buddha's word for clinging here can also mean taking sustenance, feeding on something. That's how the mind feeds. That's how we suffer. We tend to think that we suffer because we're hungry and then we're okay when we feed. That's the natural course of things. But here the Buddha is actually beginning to call into question the natural course of things. The act of feeding in and of itself is suffering. That's caused by the thirst, the time when you're feeling really hungry, all of which are very natural processes. And he's saying here, this particular natural process of being hungry and then finding yourself eating on something, either physically or mentally, that's suffering. In other words, you have a happiness that's dependent on consuming things. It needs nourishment. If it doesn't get its nourishment, it's going to die. And so you keep on looking. Now, thinkers in India, before the Buddha, talked an awful lot about feeding, but for them feeding was a good thing. After all, it's what keeps us alive. And their main concern was how to figure out what's good food and how do you supply yourself with a limitless supply. That's what the Vedas were all about. And the Upanishads picked up the idea that by mystical knowledge you would provide yourself with a limitless, infinite source of food. You'd never have to worry about food again. you get all the food you needed. And everyone was taking the idea, well, this, this is a natural process. It must be a good thing. But when you see things in that way, this is what leads people to think, well, maybe the fowls of the air and the beasts of the land were made so that we could feed on them. That's their purpose in being here. That immediately skews your perception of what's going on. That it's okay to be oppressive to other beings because this is the natural way of things. So the Buddha had the courage to call that into question. This need to feed is in and of itself suffering. 
This explains a lot of the imagery he uses for becoming and the end of becoming. In some cases he talks about food, food for the body, food for the mind. He also talks about the sustenance for fire. There's a lot of fire imagery in the canon. It's based on the idea that fire, too, needs sustenance in order to burn. Then he gives agricultural imagery. Plants need the sustenance of soil and water in order to grow. And, that, and then he uses these processes, fire, the growth of a plant and soil. The minds need to feed as analogies for the process of clinging and becoming. In every case, it is a natural process, but because this is something we have to learn how to overcome. This is where his teachings get challenging, because they force us to question a lot of our assumptions. One of the things that we cling to, of course, is our assumptions. The word sanya, which is, can be translated as perception or label, in Thailand is also translated as assumption, and it's a good translation. As we assume certain things, we get some raw sense data coming in through any of the senses, and immediately we make assumptions about it. Label it this, label it that, this must be that, that's mu that must be this. And then we cling to our assumptions. This is one of the things that makes us suffer. So when you find yourself suffering, you often have to look and see where is the assumption that you're not willing to let go of that's causing you to suffer. Of course, sometimes the response is, well, the Buddha seems to be making assumptions too in his teachings. But this fits into the general pattern of the path, is that you have to learn how to feed skillfully. As he said, we try to get the mind to the point where it's beyond the need for food, but you have to depend on food to keep the body going as you practice. But when you get the mind to a point beyond clinging, but there are certain things you have to cling to. You cling to the desire to be skillful. You cling to the desire to find a happiness that's totally innocent. So there are assumptions, and there are assumptions, the ones that cling to just keep you mired in suffering, the others that you cling to, and then they get you beyond suffering, you can finally let them go. So an important part of the practice is asking yourself, what are the assumptions that I'm holding on to that are making me suffer? Why do I like them so much? And be willing to have the Buddhist teachings question those sufferings. It's very typical here in the West to stick with our assumptions and start questioning the Buddha's assumptions. But the most fruitful, fruitful practice is to be willing to subject our own assumptions to that questioning. Like we don't like the idea that, that we have defilements. We like to think that the mind is basically pure, basically good. And somehow it's outside influences that disturb us and create the suffering. If only we could be left alone, then there wouldn't be any problems. Just follow, the, have our own natural way of doing things, and that, that would be enough. But what we're doing is we're hiding from ourselves is this impulse to feed. The mind is always hungry. We might say, well, it's a natural process, but again, the Buddha has you look at the body. The body's need for food and rest, and sometimes we say it has a need for sex. But what is the body, after all? Just four elements. Okay, which of those elements needs to feed? Which of, does the earth element want to feed? Does the water element, the fire element, the wind element, do they need food? Do they care? If you think your body cares, just let it get sick. I mean, there's going to be pain. 
and the illness, but the body doesn't feel any compunction about giving you pain. It's the mind that doesn't like the pain. As the Buddha said, that beings are a creation of the mind. If it weren't for the mind entering into these physical elements, there wouldn't be a being here. There wouldn't be a, a body. It's the mind that has all these desires. And if we think the mind is perfectly innocent, just wants to be left alone, okay, well, leave things alone for several days and see what happens. You start getting hungry. There's pain in the body. You may say, well, the body needs to be fed. The body isn't asking to be fed. That's just how the body reacts when there's no food. We don't like the pain, so we come out and we find something to end the pain. So that implicates us in this whole process of having to feed, where there's suffering both for the, the feeder and the fed upon. It's a natural process, but it's suffering. So it's not simply the case that we get the wheel on the axle right and everything will be okay. Just be allowed to follow our innocent natural needs and it's all right. There are natural needs are not all that innocent. As the Buddha once said, what is one? All beings subsist on food. Everybody has to feed in order to stay alive. Notice that he says being. The word being he defines as a creation of attachment. If it weren't for the mind's attachments, we wouldn't take on this identity as a being. We wouldn't have kept this body going. The earth, water, wind, fire, we're just going to be earth, water, wind, fire in some other form. And they're perfectly neutral about the whole thing. When the body's going to die, it doesn't ask permission, it just goes ahead and dies. It's not the body doesn't want to die. We don't want it to die. When it ages and grows ill, it's just doing its body thing. But it's the mind's desire to use the body to find happiness. That's the problem. It seems perfectly innocent, just a nice wheel placed nicely on its hub. But that's suffering, too. And so we have to learn how to question a lot of our assumptions about what's going on in the mind, what's causing trouble. If you think all the trouble's coming in from outside, a lot of what's going on in your mind is being hidden from you. Ignorance is not always innocent. Sometimes it's willful. So we have to learn how to question our need to feed. This need to keep on creating states of becoming. As the Buddha said, even the, the desire to put an end to becoming, just to block out everything and become nothing, that just leads to a different state of becoming. We can't run away from this process. We have to turn around and look at our feeding, learn how to feed skillfully to begin with as part of the path. Learn how to cling to skillful assumptions, skillful fabrications as part of the path. Learn how to let go of the unskillful ones. And whenever we find ourselves suffering for one reason or another, turn around and look at what it is that we're feeding on. And the simple fact that it's making us suffer means that it's not an innocent process. So always keep the Buddha's analysis of suffering in mind, because it's the most useful way of looking at things and prying away our ignorance of how the mind's causing suffering. It's not an issue of getting the wheel back on the hub or getting the hub back on the axle okay. 
it's a question of looking into why we feed and then learning how to strengthen the mind so that it ultimately gets to the point it doesn't need to feed anymore. That's when the definition is done its work. <laughs>